Great information for you, and we're lucky enough to be filming this program tonight. So I just want to, I don't want to take too much time, but just introduce Mercedes. She's the president of Global Purchasing Group, which is a company, fashion company, and you will hear information that is invaluable. And please hold your questions until the end. Um, just one thing to mention, as we're filming this program, Anyone who asks questions at the end, you will need to sign a release so that we can put this information and this program up on our website without problems. If you do not want to be filmed, please sit towards the back of the room just so that you won't be in the picture. The, the videographer is going to focus on the speaker and the presentation, but you may actually be in the picture at some point if you're sitting up close. Okay? No makeup. <laughs> no makeup, so just be, uh, be aware. Okay? There's a couple of, of chairs up here if you want to. There are a few empty online. chairs in the front. And I don't want to hold this up too much, so Mercedes. Thanks. So good evening, everyone. Welcome. I, um, I want to tell you a little bit more about myself because I, I feel it's important <coughs> to know um, my point of view when it comes to fashion. Um, I've been in the industry for a very long time. I come from a manufacturing family. I um, teach this class from the point of view of a buyer because that's what we are. That's my day job. We're a buying office here based in New York City. We open stores. We help with retail strategy planning. And over the years, what's happened is a lot of our clients, because they're mostly boutiques, have um, wanted to get something new, that emerging designer. And when we start buying from these emerging designers, we've noticed a couple of things. They're overpriced, their delivery is terrible, and their quality is usually lacking. So we started mentoring and we started um, doing little workshops for them. And now we actually have a whole program that's based for this emerging designer. So there isn't a right or wrong way of doing business, especially this business that's so forgiving and, you know, what didn't work yesterday works today. The other thing I, I want to kind of stress is the importance of you being comfortable. So I, I'd like to share a story with you before we start about this and, and how important it is to like know what you want and be comfortable with it. So a couple of years ago, this young man came to my office and you know there's a, different kinds of designers, but this was the ego-driven designer. And you know him, you know, he's the, I'm the new Versace, I'm the new Carolina Herrera, I'm the new, okay. We already have those designers, we don't need the new one. So we, we're looking for individuals. So he comes in, he shows me his portfolio. We, we have a, a consultation called the feasibility consultation where we look at what you're doing, we look at the price, the placement, and we kind of figure it out if it's going to work or not. So he comes in, he shows me his portfolio, and I have to tell you the truth. It was very, um, you know, art school, senior class project, you know, amateur kind of basic nonsense, right? But he's really excited. He's a good salesman. Like, he's really selling it to me. And they were just boring dresses. They were all cocktail dresses. They were the long one, the one shoulder one, you know, the typical, the V back, the scoop front, very typical. And um, so I'm looking at it, and then here's the punchline, ready? I'm like, well, tell me an idea of the prices you want to sell them for. $3,000. Okay, so now I'm like trying still to humor him, right? I'm like, Tell me a little bit about why you feel like somebody will pay $3,000. And now he starts comparing himself to all the great masters. So I'm like, you know what, here's the thing. In the U.S., there are only 70 stores that carry this price point. And guess what? They don't want Joe Schmo from Brooklyn. They want Versace and Oscar and Chanel and everybody else. So how do you compete? So we went on and we had our consultation and I have to tell you one thing about his dresses. He was um, making them domestically and he was using silk chamois, 
which is a beautiful fabric, but he was hand dyeing them himself. So yeah, right, everybody just made a face. Yeah, it's a very difficult process. And when you're hand dyeing it in the sink in your bathroom, the, there is no color um, um, consistency, right? So what I would look as a production person as a damage, it looked actually quite beautiful. So just imagine like when you're hand dyeing the silk mousse, you're trying to dye it blue, but it would come out like this royal peacock blue, and then it would like, grayed in the color like an ombre, but it, it wasn't like a tie-dye kind of a thing. It was just really beautiful and very simple, right? So he had one little signature. Okay, I dismiss him, he leaves the office, he's all pissed off at me, and we never see him again. And then I start seeing his dresses in the magazines. Town and Country, uh, Rodeo Drive magazine, uh, South Beach magazine, Hampton magazine, and he's got these dresses on the bodies of the most important socialites in, in the country. I'm like, how is this guy doing this? So then it gets worse, like fast forward a year or two, now, well not worse for me, I mean worse for me, not for him, now I start seeing him in the picture, in the event. So it's like so-and-so, the designer, with Mrs. So-and-so at the Met Ball. And I'm like, how is this guy, how did I misjudge him so much? How can I be so wrong? Like, this guy, his dresses are mediocre at best. So here, here's another side lesson. Talent isn't really the main issue. Money isn't the main issue. The main issue is the ability to hustle. And that's really what se se uh, separates so many of the people. So anyway, now fast forward again, another year goes by. This is driving me crazy. This keeps me up at night, right? And I run into him at an event, at a fashion event. So now I see him and I, you know, congratulate him and I apologize. And he's like, no, 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 no need for apologies. It was your attitude, bad he means, it was your attitude that put fire under my butt and made me hustle. I'm like, well, I'm glad that you found a positive in, you know, our conversation. But tell me, how are you getting on these women's bodies? And he said, I can't tell you, it's a secret, it's, you know, PR companies, and, you know, he made a big deal out of it. And then I said, you know what, I've been hunting you down for three years. There is no way you're going to, like, disappear and not tell me the secret. So I figured, uh, I'll liquor him up. <laughs> and I'm a real good drinker, right? I've been drinking whiskey since a teen. So I figured, you know, I'll just start drinking with him, and eventually he'll tell me something. Well, good thing. He was a one-drink Nelly, and after one drink, I had to go back in time to when he was a kid, and he dressed Barbie, and his grandmother was the only one that understood him, and all the way through to present day. So how he was getting these dresses on, on these social women's bodies is that he is a male nurse at a very famous uh, plastic surgery hospital in New York City. So these women, when you get major plastic surgery, something's going on in your life, a wedding, an anniversary, a divorce, whatever it is, right? And while he's the guy that goes home with you and drains you and takes care of you and gives you your medicine, while you're laid up, he pulls out his portfolio and says, do you really want something off the rack or do you want me to design something for you? And this is how he was networking and getting these private clients and these one of a kind. So here I come. I'm like, oh my God, this is great. This is good news. You have branding. You have these ladies that adore you. Um, you have financing behind you. We're going to dummy down your dresses. We're going to make them in China. And we're going to sell them a, a prom collection to David's Bridal for $99. I'm like, we're going to be filthy rich. This is such a great. And he looked at me like I had two heads. He's like, absolutely not. I am going to retire as a nurse in five more years. I'm going to get my full pension. I'm going to get all my benefits. I sell four dresses uh, a month. And think about it. They're costing him $300 to make. He sells them for $3,000. So I'm selling four dresses a month. And not only that, I get invited as a walker to all of these events. I love the life that I'm living. And you know what? He's right. He was comfortable in that zone. Me, I still keep up at night thinking we could be doing David's Bridal, we could be doing Kmart, Walmart, JCPenney, like whoever it is, the mass merchant. But that's not where he wanted to be. So that's a, a question that you have to ask yourself. Where do I want to be and what am I comfortable with? Not that I'll understand that, but...
so just quick reminder, <laughs> um, please turn off your cell phones. We're getting in the nitty gritty of it. And here's the mantra that I want you all to say to yourself every single day. How do I work as little as possible for the most amount of money? So if you say this to yourself, there is no way that you can be hand beating or hand sewing or it, it, that's um, a hobby. And we're here to learn how to run a business. This is not itsy, this is the big time. So again, maybe there is a, a high end designer. That's a different conversation that we need to have. But right now we're all about making the money. So the next question you have to ask yourself is this, do you wanna be rich? or do you want to be famous? Because there's plenty of famous designers that are broke. And we all know who they are, even if we go back in time. Isaac Mizrahi is a great example. Um, you know, until Target made him a deal, he was broke. I love Marc Jacobs' uh, example. He says that it took him 20 years to be an overnight success. So, and what they all have in common, if you think about it, from Galliano to everyone, they all have a day job working for somebody else. Like Marc Jacobs works for Louis Vuitton. So you have to think of that. And it, here's another uh, food for thought. Stella McCartney. Her father is a beetle, has plenty of connections, plenty of money, plenty of everything, and she still had to intern for La Croix. She still had to work under the Chloe name before that she branched out on her own. So we have to look at the big picture and the reality of our business. So here's the first pop quiz, ready? How much money do you need to start this fashion line? $20,000, $200,000, $2,000,000, all of the above. Anybody wanna take a guess? The answer is all of the above. So you're gonna need this amount of money in different stages. So don't be freaked out. I know a lot of uh, retelling and fashion books out there and even school tells you if you don't have a million dollar bank account, it's not gonna happen. But I'm here to tell you a couple of good newses. First thing is I found, you know, in my experience, the people with the least amount of money are the most successful because you have everything and nothing to lose. And, and you have to be able to work things out in the hustle and you can't afford to throw money at a problem. So I feel like that's almost an advantage. And the other good news is there probably hasn't been a better time historically to start a new collection because everybody wants something new. Every department store, every boutique, every retailer, every person, the consumer doesn't want mass produced. We don't want to look generic. We don't want to be walking around drinking the same cup of coffee. We want to be individuals and that's where the emerging excuse me, designer comes in. So <clears throat> how much money will you need and what exactly will you need it for? First thing is a logo and your um, markings. And we'll talk about expenses of, of that more specifically later on. You're gonna need some office equipment. You need to pay for samples. That's the number one expense and that's your number one priority. Um, shipping, and we'll talk about that because it's it adds up, shipping, getting your samples you know, sent to you, also the shipping of sending samples out to a retailer for them to kind of um, you know, look at it and, and approve it. Um, hang tags and labels, you'll be surprised. You're like, oh, it's only three cents a label, but you have to make 10,000 of them. It adds up really, really quickly. Um, social media, your website, your marketing, your Facebook page, you do need to have a budget for all of those things. Line sheets and postcards. This is old fashioned school. It's, um, it's so important because the easier you make the buyer's job, um, the more likely they are to buy from you. And line sheets are very important. Uh, trademarks and travel. So now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about trademarks because the question came up before we started the class. Um, every lawyer that listens to me say this cringes and sends me hate letters. But I'm basing this on my own experience. If you can only afford to trademark locally or domestically, what you're doing is putting yourself out in, cyber, in the cyber world. And there are people that this is their job to look for cute names that are being trademarked and they're pirates. So they'll steal it for Latin America, they'll steal it for Europe, they'll steal it for all these other countries that you're not even considering. But you have to from the beginning because 
We are a global market. And if you're just thinking, I'm you know, registering it for uh, t-shirts in New Jersey, you are putting yourself out there and really not protecting yourself. So I much rather that you be under the radar until you actually have a product to protect than doing this from the beginning. So if you have a limited amount of money, I would say that this is probably like the 10th thing down the, the list that you want to spend money on and you really want to develop your product. And listen, with all the new cases, have you been following them with Christian Louboutin, with Guest Jean? It's ridiculous how you could actually be a registered trademark and still lose it. So my advice is be first to market, have a product, be known for that product, and then we'll worry about pirates and everything else. Um, so a couple of equipments that you're going to need. You're going to need uh, a laptop. Um, you're going to need QuickBook accounting program. I think it's like the easiest one to use. Um, Skype is very important to communicate. Uh, files, uh, a smartphone, a sample case, a rolling rack, a small steamer. So those are just like the basic necessities, but it adds up. Now, this is a business of nickels and dimes. A nickel here and a dime there, and all of a sudden you're like, where's my cash? Where did it go? So it's important that your number one objective is not to um, be, bedazzle the end-use consumer. It's all about the focus of the industry and the retailer. So, so many designers spend tons of time and money doing fashion shows, but who is the fashion show attracting? It's not the retail buyer. It's the consumer and it's your ego. So we really have to think about where the money is being spent. Stay focused on building a brand and not making one up. So what do I mean by that? By putting uh, your logo and your name on a t-shirt doesn't make it a brand. Like you have to have product. The product has to have integrity. It has to be something of value that people want to. That decade of slapping a name on, on something and hoping that it would sell, it's gone. The consumer today is so savvy. The perception of value of country of origin, of fabrication, of uh, quality, of stitching, all of these things they know. We can't pull the wool over their eyes. Um, every single penny that you spend you have to ask yourself, what am I getting out of it? it? It's the return on the investment and that we have to be very savvy with. And here's my best bit of advice. There is never a good time to start. So I'm sure that many of you have been walking around with an idea for a very long time, but there's always this and that. It's almost like having a baby. It's never a good time and you never have enough money. So you just have to kind of do it. So, and it's the same thing with, with business. You just have to say, let's do it. So you have to do your homework. The world doesn't need another whatever it is that you're doing, t-shirt, children's clothes, pants, it doesn't matter. We already have them. So the idea is you have to be a touch point. You have to have, and this is gonna sound kind of weird and creepy, but you have to have an emotional connection with the consumer. You have to make them want you when there isn't even a need. And now, my, my favorite example of that is the diamond people, the De Beards. So for years and years and years and decades and, and centuries, traditionally when a woman got engaged, it was a single diamond ring. And then they said to themselves, well, how can we upsell this? How do we create where the same amount of people are getting married, but we want to sell them more diamonds? So they came up with this campaign called the Three Diamond Engagement Ring. Do you remember that? So one of them was, the, the, the saying was, one's for your future, one's for your past, and one's for your present. So I don't know how I got my husband to buy me a, a diamond for my past, but he did, because that's <laughs> what we wanted to do. So creating that want when I didn't even know I needed it. That's the emotion. That's the desire. That's, have you ever had a conversation with like a Starbucks drinker and like a, a coffee shop drinker or an iPhone user and a Blackberry user? These are tribes. And whether or not it's superior technology or not doesn't matter. It's the feeling that they get from having this device or using this product or drinking this coffee. The next thing is you have to understand who the consumer is. 
And it's not enough, like, it's not fair because, you know, I went around and asked uh, a couple of you some questions, but to tell me she's 25 to 45 years old and is married and has two kids, it's not enough. It really isn't enough. You have to know this person so intimately that you can guess what they want. So think of it this way. It's not enough to tell me that she's a coffee drinker or a tea drinker. You need to tell me what kind of sugar she puts in her coffee. So think about it. Splenda, equal, sweet and low. It's a completely different mindset. And that's how well you have to know this person. So what we like to recommend, and we just started doing this, it's crowdsourcing. It's crowdsourcing for um, consumer behavior information. You're like, wow, that sounds kind of like complicated and, and hard to do. Back in the day, literally, you could pay these big agencies to do these very micro studies on consumer behavior. Now you can do your own. And we started with Twitter. So let's say that you're doing a children's line. So now you, you uh, start to tweet um, children, mommies, uh, whatever it is, and you're going to start pe seeing people that are talking about it. And once you start following them on Twitter, and you'll see like one person will have three people that follow them, one person will have 30,000 people that follow them. That's the guy you want to follow. Because obviously they have a lot to say about children's clothing or lingerie or women's fits or plus sizes or whatever it is. This is your personal focus group that you're developing. The next thing we like to do is we like to friend them on Facebook. And we're just not friending the consumer, we're also fr uh, friending the retailer. So now, every time that the retailer posts something, we're doing a trunk show, we're having an event, we're having a sale, we're looking for emerging designers, you're on top of it, you're seeing what they're doing. And as far as the consumer, you know everything about this person because they're telling you what movies they went to, what restaurant they went to, what their kids are doing for the summer, and understanding their life and their profile is how a designer can build a wardrobe, build a collection, based on need, and then you create the want. So it's really important to know this consumer um, that well. And the next thing is identify the retailer. Because you might have a brilliant idea and you might be able to do it at a great price and you might understand what the consumer wants and needs, but if there isn't a retail channel for you to sell at, regardless of what it is, um, boutiques or department stores or discounters or you know national chains, you have to make sure that the product fits a retailer. It just can't be a random product that has no presence. And that, unfortunately, is a big problem with a lot of uh, ideas or concepts. They have these brilliant ideas for plus sizes or plus size children or um, you know, sports bras that are you know, extra uh, large sizes. But who's the retailer? Who's selling this? And then, of course, you're going to be angry. You're going to say, oh, but there's such a need. But if there isn't a retail placement, then you don't have a business. You have a concept. And that's how it works. So one of the homework assignments that I want you to do, and is very important, is you have to come up with a list of at least 100 retailers. The name, the address, the zip code, the email address, their website, and a contact. And if you can come up and, and doing this homework assignment, while it's really a long assignment, you're going to know a couple of things. The prices that these stores sell at, the stores that actually sell a product that would fit your want, and, um, and what they're, they're all about. So those three things are really important. Now, I've had designers come back to me and say, you know what, Mercedes, I can't find any retailers that are going to carry my product. Well, guess what? Then you don't have a business. You have a concept and an idea. It's so important. This is one step that you cannot skip. And then once you know the retailer and you understand the prices and you understand who your competition is, everything else falls into place. So let's talk about costing. Traditionally, this is how costing was taught to us. We took the cost of our fabrics, our trims, our production, and that equals our cost. So, you know, in, in the audience before, somebody had mentioned that, oh, you know, I'm just really small and I have small quantities and the factory is really overcharging me. You have to be able to negotiate what you need, not let the factory dictate what they want. And, and again, this is not a business for shy and intimidated and wallflowers. This is not a business for you. This is a business for the aggressive. Every single day you're at war, you're at 
in, in a battlefield. And you have to be able to claim your stake. You know, it's funny, I had gone to a lecture years ago about the guy that was running um, Liz Claiborne at the time. And he had done a really good job of like buying other brands like Liz Claiborne owns Juicy Couture and Lucky and all these guys. And he was, every experience that he was talking about being in the industry, he referred back to being at Viet, in Vietnam. I'm like, that's like the aggressiveness of our business. Like he was having flashbacks. So <laughs> retail costing, comes with a lot of other things. We have to also uh, include the cost of making samples. You are spending $1,000 making samples, you better be able to put that back into the cost of the, of the price. The cost of doing sales, production, uh, distribution, administrative, and of course, you need to leave something for a profit. Um, everything that you do is worth doing if you're making money. So I wanna address this right now. A couple of you also, and I get this a lot from uh, designers that I work with, a lot of you will say to me, well, I just want to get the product out there in the different stores, and then later, once I get my numbers up and I get a little bit more established, I'll start charging more. I'm going to tell you as a buyer, if I'm used to buying your bags at $100, and then three months from now when you were in a couple of magazines and a celebrity wore it, you're going to tell me that that bag now is double in price, I'm going to say goodbye because I'm used to retailing at a certain price. Everything you do, you can never go back up in price, but you could always go down in price and, and fit that kind of niche and need. Everything you do has to be with the purpose of making money. That's it, that is the return on your investment. The other thing is that you have to keep in mind, it doesn't matter what it costs you to make, the consumer only cares what they are paying for it. So sometimes designers will tell me like these elaborate stories about how uh, these uh, fibers were uh, from a small uh, Himalayan uh, monks who like gather it when the full moon is out and it's hand woven by, you know, Tibetan, you know, shepherds and, you know, they have a great story. But guess what? The consumer doesn't care. Stories, emotion are value added price is, is still a driver when it comes to um, retail. Now, I'm just going to totally contradict myself too. The consumer is willing to pay for what other people don't have. So if you really do have this brilliant story of indigenous people making things for you, it's great, but it has to be at a price that the consumer understands. It can't be 10 times, 5 times, 3 times the price of something normal. And you have to think of it too that Everything has already been done. How do you um, make yourself different? So, in case you haven't noticed, all my slides have subliminal messages, just letting you know. Um, the way that we come up with price is we work it backwards. So the first thing is you have to understand what the retail price is. So right now, if we look at all the contemporary dress designers, you know, Nanette Lepore and DVF and Millie and all of these guys, their dresses, their day dresses are at retail at $395 or $385. So now you know that is the retail price. That is um, the consumer's price resistance that they're willing to pay for a contemporary dress today. Now we have to understand what the retail markup is. So the retail markup usually, I would say, is a 2.3 markup. Nobody keystones, nobody doubles the price. That's really old school kind of uh, retailing. It doesn't work that way anymore. So the idea is that once you know the retail price, you can figure out what the wholesale price is going to be. So we take the retail, we divide it by 2.3, and that gives us the wholesale price. Now, this is really important too. These are just like general rules, but remember, the more money the retailer can make, the more likely they are going to buy from you. So a conversation with a retailer is, I already know you carry children's clothes, I know you carry um, junk food and you carry this other guy, but guess what? I know that you're only making a 2.2 markup on those uh, items. On my stuff, you can make a 2.5 and we're gonna supply you quickly with different goods so you never have to have a giant inventory. We didn't even show them one product yet, but we we're already telling them, you're making more money at a faster turn and you don't have to keep inventory um, because I'm gonna be uh, in a position to supply you. That's music to every buyer's ears. 
And that's really how you have to kind of think of what you're selling. So from the wholesale price to the cost price, usually the rule of thumb is three times. If you cannot get that product made for three times what you want to wholesale it for, which whatever it is that it needs to be retailed for, you are not in business with that product. And you have to think of how you yourself are going to dummy it down or source it better or do something to get to that price. Now, again, I have to warn you, um, the conversation with every factory, and I think one of the biggest mistakes that um, designers do when they're negotiating with a factory is they um, ask them, how much does it cost to make? So if you start a conversation with a factory like that, you are telling them, I don't know what I'm doing, please take advantage of me. And you don't wanna give off that vibe. So the idea is that you come in and whatever that price is, let's say it's $10, we're gonna start at $5. And you're gonna say, I need to make these t-shirts for $5. Every factory around the world is gonna say the same thing. What are you nuts? We can't make this for $5. What do you think, this is a Chinese factory? Even though you're in China in a Chinese factory, that's what he's going to tell you. So now you're like negotiating and it, and it goes back and forth. Then he's going to say, you need 10,000 units. And you're going to say, what are you nuts? This is not a, a national uniform. This is a, a fashion item that we need to be in and out of. And I'm willing to like go up in price, but you need to be more realistic with your uh, quantities. And you're going to go back and forth and back and forth until you meet the agreement where you're comfortable, where he's comfortable. And, and now we had the question before too, well, what if I don't meet my minimums? And that's really, um, I wanna answer it, I don't have a slide for it, but that's called being in a cut to order position. So you wanna uh, manage your risk by only putting into production the amount of goods that have been paid for. So if I know that I'm marking up three times and I need to make 100 units, I really only need to sell or pre-sell you know, 33 of them or 34 of them. Because now I know that if I put it into production, all the production is paid for from, from that initial order. And that puts you in a positive cash flow and an in-stock position. And that's what you wanna be able to do. And that's really what the investors wanna see. So it's all about uh, building the brand. Um, the important thing is, to outsource everything. Most of us are not designers. Most of us cannot make patterns. Most of us cannot uh, sew. I personally can't sew a button on. So understanding what we're good at and what our strengths are and being able to outsource is very important. And the great thing about this industry is, or our business is that everything is outsourceable. But again, the more money you have, the more money you tend to like throw away at a problem and you have to be careful. This is a great example of a logo. This logo cost $79.50. This logo that BP wanted to redo um, cost $4.6 million. I think that logo is cuter. So that's one of the examples. One of the websites that I happen to really like is elance.com. And elance is a um, website where all these talented people bloggers, designers, graphic artists, um, all of these people are on there and you bid, they all bid against each other um, in order to get the creative job from you. Um, one of the other things I like to talk about is making the factory your partner. So there is a hard way and an easy way of doing everything. I feel that when you have to piecemeal all of the parts together, um, and we'll go through the list of things that needs to be done. Um, it's very hard and time consuming to make your samples. So I want you to start looking um, for factories that are called full service or full package sometimes or vertical. And the difference between the two is a vertical factory actually makes the product and, and, the, and the textile and the fabrics. A full service pack, uh, factory um, doesn't make the fabrics, but they're able to put everything together for you, almost like a production manager. They're able to put everything together for you and give you one uh, finished product. So this is my preference of doing the work. So now the question comes up, well, you know, I'm, I'm a small potato and, you know, they're not going to be serious with me because these factories are, uh, are used to doing big quantities. But here's the thing. 
if you can't sell 300 dresses or whatever it is that you're making, you don't have a business. So it's not even an issue to think about. So you have to think, and listen, one of the biggest things that I, I want you to take away with from here today is the ability to look at the big picture and to think big. So now I have to quote from my favorite movie, Wall Street, because I was going to be a Wall Street uh, raider. That was 20 years ago. The movie Wall Street, there is a scene where Michael Douglas is driving down Fifth Avenue. He's with his protege. And he says to his protege, you know why you will never be me? Because you can't think like me. You want to fly in first class? I own my own plane. So that's the mental state I want you to be in. Own the plane. Don't think that first class is the ultimate. It's not. It's really about thinking about the big picture. How are you going to take this one product and how are you going to scale? How are you going to grow? How are you going to get licensing agreements? How are you going to work as little as possible for the most amount of money? So, and it starts from here. If you think small potatoes, if you go around the garment district or LA uh, garment district, regardless, and you start doing everything piecemeal or you start doing things at home and you get two of your friends to help you in your grandmother's crochet uh, club to make you little sweaters, it's a hobby. It's itsy. It's not a business. So you can do this. You can definitely do this. Um, a, a little bit about communications. So now the factory wants to know what exactly is it that you want to make. And this is an example of a very basic uh, tech sheet. And, and the thing is, I wouldn't spend money on samplings and muslims. Of course, if you're doing something in the high-end uh, price point and you have a lot of custom fabrics, that's a different story. But generally, you don't want to spend a lot of money in this process. And you also want to find a factory that's item specific. So that means that you're not going to go to a jean factory and have them make you t-shirts because either they're going to do a really bad job of it or they're going to outsource it to somebody else and there's price increase for doing that. So you want to be able to, if I'm getting polo shirts made, I'm going to go to a polo shirt factory. They're already going to have the patterns made. I'm going to look at, and this is a, another um, part of it, um, you could either send them a picture of the item that you want to make or they have what's called a history closet. So a history closet is every single thing that they've ever made, they keep one of. So now the idea is that we look at their polo shirt closet and we pull out, oh, we love the knit collar of this one, but we like the ribbing of that one and we like the, the sleeve length of this one and I like the stripes of this other one. So now we take all of these items, put them together and come up with our own design. So usually at this point, the question comes up, oh, the factories don't protect my design. Nobody protects your design. You cannot protect design. People will charge you lots of money and tell you, you could get a patent, you can get, you cannot protect design. So here's my answer to that. Learn to copy yourself because somebody else will. So learn to be in all the different price points because there's always somebody faster, bigger, smarter, and with more money than you that's gonna copy you. Or on the other side of the spectrum is this design something so absolutely out of control that nobody can copy it because it's so expensive to do. And my favorite example of the season is the Prada hot rod shoe. Have you seen that with the big giant flames? You know that that shoe is not going to end up at Aldo or at Payless. It's impossible. So those are your two options. Copy yourself or make something so radically designed that it's impossible, cost efficiency um, wise. So. The other thing is we have to have um, clear communications. And you know, I don't, I, I mean, I started in this business when all we had, like the only electronic communication we had besides a landline was a telex machine. If you don't know what that is, Google it. A telex <laughs> machine. And they used to charge us by the letter. So I remember being in mainland China, trying to communicate with the office in New York, skipping every other vowel to save money, right, on the communication. And here's the best part, I'm dyslexic. So can you imagine that? That made no sense. I, I could have sent a courier pigeon and it would have gotten there faster or, or better. So 
The idea now with technology, with all the resources that we have available to us, it's really important to be able to send pictures, send little videos, um, to communicate. So this is an inspiration, right? We're not a knockoff, it's not a copy, it's an inspiration. This sweater was from one of the more famous brands and we loved it and we thought it was very cute and we sent it. We sent this to a factory that makes sweaters. That's all they do. And of course they're going to have a cardigan and of course they're going to have a cardigan with appliques. So they sent back this first sample. And the first sample was pretty close but we really didn't like the placement of the flowers. So we made some other suggestions and then we said, you know what, we really want just a big cluster of flowers instead of all of this business going on in the sweater. So we're going back and forth, sending pictures, making annotations. And even at sometimes when we're talking about fit, a little video from your cell phone with the product on really communicates to the factory. And again, this saves a tremendous amount of money. So this is the end product. We got it, we like the sweater, we like the, the placement of the, of the uh, flowers. And one of the things that we realized too was that we wanted some embroidery and some better uh, logo um, details and we sent that to them and let them know for production. So one of the things that, oh I did have a slide on this, it's important to limit the risk. This is what the money men want to know. So one of the things is limit the amount of fabrics that you have in your collection because then you can purchase the fabrics in bigger quantities and you know people are always nervous about um, when they say you have to buy like a thousand yards to get the right price but break it down what's a thousand yards if your dresses are taking three yards that's only 300 dresses that you need to make they come in two colors they come in four sizes like when you break it down that's only 25 stores that you have to sell to if you can't sell 25 stores then you don't have a business you have a hobby don't be afraid of minimums everything's negotiable and I always like it when factories are, are really aggressive about their minimums right oh you have to make a thousand units but how do you get to a thousand you have to make the first hundred right and the second hundred and the third hundred. So everything's negotiable. There is a process. There is a way of reaching the minimums or, or a comfort zone that you have to be in agreement with, with the factory. If you're buying from overseas, and this is really important, ask for the landed price. Because you might be getting this great shirt from Peru for $3.80, and then when you land it, it's six bucks. It makes a big difference. And it does, that sounds like an exaggeration, but it's usually not. So in the beginning, because it is a business of nickels and dimes, I'm going to leave it up to the factory to give me the landed price. And they're going to figure out how to ship it to me, you know, what the broker's fees are, what the customs fees are, if there's any duties that are involved, all of that kind of stuff they're going to figure out. In the future, you're going to hire what's called a traffic person or a traffic manager. And this traffic manager, their job is to get it from point A to point B the cheapest possible way. And they're gonna know how to fill containers and how to do master cartons. They, they know how to do all of these things. They're like idiot savants. They're like brilliant. When, like we had a dinner conversation recently and we said, you know, I threw out the, um, the example. How many jit, uh, jeans fit in a 40 foot high cube container? And they all looked at each other. Are we talking men's or women's or children? Are we talking plus sizes or regular? Are like they, they, that's what they do. That's all they do. The other thing is that, you know, as a kid, my uncle uh, once told me, to understand this business, I needed to know the price of rice in China. And that seems like kind of odd and kind of out there. But think about it. If the price of rice in China goes up and people are hungry, they're not working. And everything is like that. So now let's say that we're producing in South America and our boat is getting ready to leave on September the 15th. September 15th is the middle of hurricane season. So now if there is a hurricane happening in the Gulf, guess what, my boat's not going anywhere for two more weeks. And if I'm late on my deliveries, so see, like we live in this global world, everything has a domino effect on what we're doing and we have to be aware of all of those things. Factories are very, very item specific. Do not use them for things that they're not known for. And you know, there's a great example of a celebrity line. I won't mention who he is, but he thought that he was bringing sexy back. And he um, made these men's shirts in a woman's 
blouse factory. So just, you would think a woven shirt's a woven shirt, right? It's got buttons down the front, it's got a collar, how hard can it be? But when the production came in, the armpit didn't fit because they had still scaled it or graded it to fit a woman, not a man. So you need to be very specific. And it, it always worries me when you're in the factory making your woven blouses and they're like, oh yeah, you know, we can do jeans too. They can't. The, the labor, the hand of the labor, um, the, um, the machines that they have, the tools that they have are all very different. And it's funny because I could always tell when a sewer was used to doing knits and then switches to wovens because she's still trying to, um, I'm sorry, the opposite, does wovens and switches to knits because she's stretching the fabric and knits when you stretch them, it skips, you know, when you're sewing. It's all of those little details that make a big difference in your production. Always put yourself in this cut to order position. I cannot stress it enough. You don't want to make anything unless you have pre-orders from retailers. It's not enough that all your friends like it. It's not enough that all your uh, friends, friends, and families want to buy one. That's not a business. That's a hobby. You want to make sure that if you know what your minimums are and what your break even is, that you always put yourself in that position. And it's funny because, you know, you're going to struggle, you're going to get um, all this production stuff done. And then the last equation is the sales. That's the last 10% of your business is doing the sales. And you're going to get frustrated and you're going to say to yourself, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and produce it. And then it doesn't sell and now you're having sample sales and yard sales and flea markets and garage sales and you're doing events because you have to get rid of your inventory. Think of it this way. This is your business plan. Your business plan is you're going to make samples. You're going to go door to door. You're going to make the sales. And if they sell, you have a business. If they don't sell, you go back to scratch to whatever it was that you were doing or back to square one. That's our business plan. So one of the things that these are actually all of the steps that are involved in making a sample. And this is, again, if you're not going with a full package factory or a vertical factory, these are all the steps that are necessary in order to get your samples done. You need that pattern made. You need to buy the fabrics, the trims, and get the labor involved with that. Um, you need the cutting, the cutting ticket. And, I, you know, I remember, like, here in New York City, we still cut in a lot of places with scissors. Like in most places around the world, they use laser cutters and laser cutters with a Gerber system. It's like miracle technology. The amount of waste of fabric is so limited compared to how it was. And I remember my uncle had this cutter and he always would joke around like, don't touch my, like he, what would he would say, he would say, uh, I rather you, what was it? Mess with my wife, but don't mess with my sisters. Mm -hmm. So that's how like serious they take like their equipment. Um, so it has to be cut it, it has to be fitted on a model, the grading has to be done, but the grading we only do once we know we're going into production because that's another expense that you're going to have to have. Um, any special dyes that have to be done, any uh, lab dips, any special colors, uh, any kind of screens that you have to custom made for the graphics, um, any handling from one factory to the other has to be kind of managed too. So. There are many lives of your samples. The first one is what we call the first sample. And I'm going to tell you this. You're going to remember me telling you this. When you get that first sample, please don't cry. It's okay. Like I know that you communicated as much as you could and you thought that you were very clear, but there's always room for interpretation. Let's just call it that. So don't be upset. Um, the second thing is what's called a counter sample. So now we get the sample, we make the corrections, we send it back, and they make us another sample. But I want to say this too at this point. It is so important that the minute you get that crappy sample that you go out and sell. And I'm telling you now as a buyer, especially buyers that understand emerging designers and you're not going to get it right the first time around and we're supportive, it's so important to show us so that we save the money for you. Because once our budgets are bought out, there is no coming back. You have to be able to, and it's totally acceptable. It's never going to be perfect. The timing is never going to be right. You want to be able to show the buyer the t-shirt, the dress, the pant, whatever it is, the handbag, and say, you know what? 
this is the bag, this is the body of the bag, but it's going to be in a nicer Italian skin. And then you're going to show them a sample of the, of the skin. Or you're going to say, this is the body, but these are the four prints that it's going to come in. So they get it, and, and it's important for them to say, wow, I really like it, or give you some kind of feedback, and let them save the money for you. Now, some buyers will buy on the spot. They understand, they get it. Um, some buyers will want to see the next sample, which is the counter sample. The third sample that you're going to end up having is called the salesman sample. So this is perfect. It's the right fabric. It's the right color. Um, but it doesn't fit anybody. And it always worries me. And I could always tell like the amateur buyers um, in the trade shows, because they're the ones trying on the samples, mm -hmm. it doesn't fit anybody. It's all about um, just getting like the look and the feel of the product. And then the third sample that you're going to end up having is what we call the production sample. And the production sample literally means that it's being taken out of the inventory, out of the warehouse, and that's exactly with the bag, with the tags, with the label, everything is perfect. This is what's sitting in my warehouse. And a lot of buyers like to buy from that um, position or from that sample, especially when they're trying a new designer. So you have both kinds of buyers, the ones that are edgier and willing to take a chance, and then the ones that want you to prove to them that you've already produced a product. Um, there are many samples that you might want to have. And usually, you know, as you grow, in the beginning, I advise you to have one sample and because of for cost reasons. But in the future, you might want to consider your sample, um, a road sample, and it depends on how many salespeople you're going to have. You might have one guy in Chicago, one in Dallas, one in LA, one in New York, one in Atlanta. So those are five samples plus yours that you need to have. Another good idea is the production samples to keep a couple handy because those are called lending samples and those are the ones that like a stylist will call you at six o'clock in the morning saying we need something for good morning america you better have it ready and and that's that kind of a situation um the other thing is the trims like this absolutely drives me crazy and each person, whether it be like the, the people that make the, the collars or the buttons, buttons. Have you had a conversation with a button person? They're, you can't just say, hey, I want a button. Then they start, well, what material do you want it out of? Do you want it out of plastic or resin or shell or coconut? Or are you like, I want a, a button. Do you want it metal? Do you want it snapped? Do you want it four holes, two holes? You're like, four holes or two holes? These are the micro decisions that you need to make. And they make a difference in the garment. Even like zippers, invisible zippers, two-way zippers, hidden zippers, pocket flashers if you're doing pants or denim is very important because that's how the consumer can identify it when it's folded in, in the rack. Um, care instructions, there's all these legal issues that have to be addressed with their care instructions. Um, sizing, you want to be able to um, communicate the sizes of your products, so that is something that we have to get down. And of course, the country of origin. So I, I want to talk to you for one second about um, perception of value. So it really makes a difference where things are made and, and the materials that you use. So that's something that you have to keep in mind when we're talking about consumer price resistance. So I'm going to use this example. Two blouses, exactly the same. Same print, same style, same everything. One of them is made of 100% polyester and made in China. The other one is 100% silk and made in Italy. The perception of value is in the Italian one. The actual value and quality is in the Chinese one. And I'll give you my, my explanation. Polyester is a miracle fabric. Like you can wash it and wear it. We joke that you can set fire to it, shake it out, and you can wear it the next day. China has done nothing for the last 20 years. They make state-of-the-art super factories. They can make one item or they can make 10 million items, and the quality is always the same. Now let's look at Italy. Silk. Have you worn silk on a humid day? <laughs> Have you not wanted to kill someone? It doesn't take color well. It's only dry cleanable. It has a huge carbon footprint. Vegans hate it. So it has a lot of bad things going on. And now let's talk about old world craftsmanship in Italy. Do you want me to interpret what that means? A 200-year-old machine when an 80-year-old woman with no quality standards. 
Like every person, like you could get, especially this happens a lot with footwear. You could get a size eight shoe and you could get three different eights, but they were made by three different people and they fit three different ways. Mm -hmm. So the perception of value is so much stronger in the Italian silk product, but the real value and the education of the customer comes in the Chinese polyester garment. So one of the ways... The price is cheaper? Uh, I'll hold that. Oh, yeah, it's considerably cheaper. That's, that's the other issue there. But the value isn't, shouldn't be cheaper. Um, one of the things that I want uh, to talk... There was a couple of people that I feel that this is really important to, is the use of QR codes. So you know those weird little squares that you see on everything? So if you have a product that... Um, you know, changes or has a special benefit like a fit or, you know, a convertible or something of that nature, or you're making your bags or your accessories in a small village in the middle of Ethiopia. Um, those are the things that you want to shoot a video and have a QR uh, tag. Because now at retail, when anybody with a smartphone scans it, they can go right to the website or they could go right to the video and be demonstrated the product that you're making. So that's like one more element that you want to consider when designing. So ready? Pop quiz number two. You have $2,000 to spend on marketing, public relations, and advertising. How do you spend it? And $2,000 is generous. On a fashion show, at a booth at a trade show, visiting retailers, buying lunch for an intern. That's a fat intern. The answer is both C and D. So ideally is we want to reach the retailer, not the end use consumer. We want to be able that every penny that we spend has a return on investment. You know, doing trade shows is part of the circuit. It's what you have to do, but it's also about managing that risk. So my suggestion is when we start selling and people will say, well, I'm going to be at Style Mart in, in Chicago and four or five people tell you that, then I advise you to go to that trade show and set up a booth because you know you have these five people that are gonna come and see you and, and write an order. And ho hopefully write orders big enough to offset the cost of being at that show. So even if you wipe it off and it's a zero cost, that's great, that was money well spent. Now, I'm gonna warn you, if you start out by going to trade shows in the beginning, you're going to get lost. Nobody knows you. The buyers, the way that they buy, they first buy the brands that they work with, then they buy the ones that they've heard of, and then they buy the new guy. And guess what? By the time I get to the new guy, I'm tired, my feet hurt, I spent all my money, I'll see you next time. So you get lost unless you're able to build like this little uh, client base. So getting the word out. How do we do all the marketing and advertising? You must have a website. And, and here's the important thing about the website. Again, you don't want a website that's uh, focused on uh, end-use consumer. And I hate those websites. Like, as a buyer, when I have to go to a website and I have to wait for it to download the flash and then you're playing some kind of crazy music in the background, I'm already annoyed and I click out. You want a website that's to the point, that has a purpose, and the purpose is to sell wholesale. That's your main objective. The next thing is, it's so important to have those Twitter and those Facebooks account. And again, it's not necessarily about um, speaking to the consumer or to the retailer. It's about listening to them and listening to what they have to say and, and what they want. Um, it's really important to be on top of uh, editorial calendars. And every magazine um, has these editorial calendars. The purpose is for you to advertise in them. But now you can see when they're having the swimsuit issue and the up-and-coming uh, designer issue. And in the, rear, the weirdest magazines cover fashion. Like, I happen to love uh, Fast Company magazine. I think they do an excellent job about focusing on small businesses and fashion and retail. My, one, two of my favorite stories uh, about our industry were uh, from uh, Fast Company, and one of them was about Lululemon. you got to read about that guy. He's a nut. And there was another article about um, the Chinese manufacturing in different countries like Latin America. And, but that kind of information, and, and here's the other thing too, when you get um, uh, featured or, or are part of the story or quoted as an industry expert in Fast Company 
in Business uh, Weekly, in Inc., in Entrepreneur Magazine. Who is reading that? Not the fashion uh, victim, the investor. And that's who you want their attention. And also, anybody that's in business, anybody that owns a boutique, reads business magazines because that's the nature of our business. One of the uh, fashion magazines that I, I absolutely love, they do an excellent job, and it's really become the, the Bible of the uh, boutique, is Lucky Magazine. They do a great job. They do a great job of promoting uh, independence by doing their lucky shops, by having specials, by having a website flash sales. They do a, an, ama a, an amazing job. And one of the things that if you're ever on this page, and you have to petition it, this doesn't happen because they discover you, you have to make yourself visible. And it's two to watch. And they do this uh, highlight every couple of months on like the two new designers to watch and what they're about and what their inspiration is. And it's a great story. The other thing that I found out, it, it, well, that I've realized, when you are pitching to uh, magazines, it's important for you to write your own story. And you'll be surprised how many times they just cut and paste. And if you're like, well, I'm not a writer, uh, I don't know, this is what you do. Read a story about another designer or a retailer or whatever it is, and then substitute the name. So-and-so started in blah, 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 doing yak, 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 and that's what you do. You've cut and paste your profile in a story that, you know, has already been published. Um, so editorial calendars are very important. Network online, in person. You want a blogger to write about you, you better be friends on Facebook with that blogger. If you want an editor to pick you up and, and say something about you, you better be their friend. You better go to events and, and network. And here's the other thing about networking. It's not the person that you meet at that moment. It's all the other people that they know. That's important. The other thing is you get these opportunities to meet people and then you don't ask them for anything. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a trade show or whatever, and people will say, oh, I've been watching your videos, and I know all about you and your business, and I love what you're doing, and I'm a new designer. And then they thank me for their time and walk away. What was the purpose? You have that moment of opportunity. What do you want from me? I would like you to come to my booth. I would like, you to, I would like to send you an email. Do you have a, a business card that I can share with you? All of these things are really important. So here's another homework assignment. Ready? If you could meet one person that would change your business, who is it? And what would you ask of them? That's a really important question. And it's funny because we always come up with all of these excuses, why we can't, why we can't, why we can't. Well, who's the person? Who's the person that you need to call? Is it Oprah? and say, hey, Oprah, I need to be in your magazine? Is it Obama? And say, listen, I want Michelle to wear my dress this time around. Like, who is it? And what would you ask them for? So the next thing is the bloggers. They're our friends. And you know what's interesting? I really feel like some of social media is overhyped. Like, I, I, I'm not even going to ask, but I often ask, how many blogs do you read a week? And the answer is like one or two. But there's nine million blogs out there. So I really feel that it kind of gets lost, but it's not an option in doing business anymore. It's part of doing business. So being friends with them, doing all that social media. Postcards, I feel that they're great. And that's how you become the brand that nobody knows but has heard of. Like when I go to the trade shows and I look up and I see a name, I'm like, what do I know this name from? I don't think immediately the 700 emails and the 400 postcards that I've received from this person, I think this name sounds familiar. And that's what you want to kind of do, build that familiarity. Um, sales. So again, th this is a whole day class that we teach. Uh, I just want to kind of give you the basics because it is a very crucial part of um, money and expense and startup and capital and all that kind of fun stuff. It all starts with an email. Send that picture of your items. You have your list of 100 retailers that you want to target. Send them that email. And when you send that email, send it using a service that you can track. And there's plenty of services. There's, there's eye contact and constant contact and something with a monkey. MailChimp, that's the one. There's all these different um, services. They're professional. They have templates. They offer to opt out, which is part of the law of um, privacy. 
um, all of these services, but most importantly, you're going to be able to see who opens the email. And whoever opens it and then goes to the website, that's your hot list. That's the person that you're going to follow up with a phone call on the next day and say, hey, listen, I understand that you opened our email. Do you have any questions? How can I help you write an order? Can I send you a line sheet? And that's the kind of communication that you want to have. Review the opens, follow up with a phone call, send another follow-up postcard. And this is important too, offer to send them a sample. Because remember, if we can save money and not having to go to the trade shows, that $12 that you're going to spend on mailing it and mailing it back is really important. One of the other bits of advice when you send a, a sample to a retailer or a couple of samples to a retailer, make sure that you put in a return address that's already paid for with your FedEx number or your UPS number, regardless. And also enclose a invoice. And make the inv invoice for a ridiculous amount of money because it's a sample, right? And that way you are sure that they're going to return it to you because there's an invoice. Um, regional markets, I happen to actually really like regional markets because I feel that they're more specialty store friendly and they're also more emerging designer friendly. There's a couple of um, trade like regional markets like Atlanta and Dallas that really do a nice job of promoting um, the emerging uh, designer. Uh, in Atlanta, I think it's called Premier. In uh, Dallas, it's called uh, Be Seen. But these are special areas within the market that highlight the new guy. So I think that that's great. Um, local road reps. And, and here's the other thing, too, that I, I should talk to you about. And, and this is pretty much the order that you want to be in. Um, a showroom or a really professional, well-established uh, salesman is not going to take on a new line. They will charge you participation fee every month, but they're not going to sell anything. And the reason why is this. They will not put their reputation out in the market for you. They don't know if you're funded. They don't know if you can um, supply uh, on a timely basis. They don't know anything about you. So they're, and as a buyer, when I go into a multi-line showroom and one of the brands didn't ship me, I'm not going to be mad at the brand. I, don't even know who they are, I'm going to be mad at the salesman that told me that this was the best thing because now I'm short money and my store is empty. So it is so important to understand that you need to do your sales in the beginning. So ready? Pop quiz number three. You need money to start. Who do you ask? The SBA, mom and dad, angel investors, venture capitalist, a sugar daddy. Or sugar mama? <laughs> the answer is all of the above. You get the money where you can. Um, I'm going to be very frank. I feel like the SBA um, and all of these like minority loans and women business loans, they forget to tell you the amount of paperwork that you have to do to fill out and to actually qualify for any of that. You have to be in business for three years, all these kinds of things. Also, some of these loans, it's 2 or 3% above prime. I almost rather you max out a couple of credit cards or go to a loan shark, those are the venture capitalists, before we even bother to go through all of that because it's so really dreadfully time-consuming and disappointment. They, a bank would rather lend you money to remodel your kitchen than to start a business. That's the way that the industry works. So let's look at what the money men want and who are they. Um, the first thing is beg and borrow. It cannot be beneath you to ask people for money. Um, sell everything that you own. Learn to live very humbly. So you don't need 3,000 channels on your cable bill. You could just watch CNN or nothing. Watch it online. Have perfect personal credit because this is what they're going to look at. Look for grant money, countries um, like uh, fabrics, uh, the lensing people, they do advertisement in fashion, right? They have to have an outfit in that poster, in that advertisement. That item can be you. So there's a lot of that. Use a factor. A factor is a bank that based on receivables will lend you some money and they're also in charge of collecting the money. So when you're ready to work with um, national chains and you're ready to work with um, department stores, you would never, ever give them credit. You would go through a factoring bank. 
Um, so you can sell equity in a, in a company, which is not my favorite way to go, but it is doable. And then I don't know how many of you have heard of Kickstarter or uh, Indiegogo. Um, both of them, especially Kickstarter, I feel has given me back my uh, trust in humanity where you can actually post the, the item or the idea or the need that you have for your collection and people from around the world make a donation. And the nice thing about it is it's a donation. You don't have to pay it back. The bad thing and the good thing about that is that if you don't hit your goal, you get nothing which as an investor, I love because if you needed $2,000 to do a trade show and you got 500 bucks, you're going shopping for yourself at that 500 bucks. But if I know it was an all or nothing, then I know most likely you're gonna use it for what your original intention was. And I really love this kind of, uh, and it's worked very well for a lot of people that we work with. Have private clients. I started today with the story about the evening dresses. It definitely works. And my number one rule, don't quit your day job. So now this is another like situation that we get all the time. Oh, well, I don't have time to do this. Well, I don't have enough money to do this. If you put all of those excuses, you'll never do it. The idea is to have discipline. So I remember when I was starting a, a new business, the discipline was from 8 p.m. every night until midnight. That was my part-time job. And that was the discipline. You wanted to go out to dinner, you wanted to catch me for a drink, you better be at six o'clock because at eight, I have to start my job. And that's the kind of dedication and discipline that you have to have. So money men, the evil witch, see, subliminal, you getting it? Um, money men don't care about your portfolio. They don't care about the designs. They don't care that you're best friends with Beyonce. They don't care that you've dressed all of these celebrities and been in all these magazines. They only care about these four things. The first one is how much money you need. And you need to be realistic about this. Um, asking for too little or asking for too much is a weird balance. How are you going to use it or what you need it for? And this is important because now if we go to an investor and say, oh yes, I want to do New York Fashion Week and I need $25,000 to do a fashion show. No, they're not giving you money for your ego. They want a return on the investment, which brings how long you need it for, and the, follow and the last question is, what's in it for them? So now the conversation starts like this. I need $50,000 to go into production because I have $150,000 worth of orders. All of these orders are on credit card terms, so I probably need the money for around 120 days, that's production and shipping, and I'm willing to give you 10%. That's the conversation. Nothing else, no fluff, no icing, no n just basic money. There are a couple of things that I found, like these uh, personality traits, that makes some designers more successful than others. And the first one is having discipline. So if you have an excuse for things, you're never going to get there. You know, personally, my excuse this week for not going to the gym is it's raining. I literally live next door to the gym. So that was an excuse. You, you have to stop yourself from doing that. Um, the insane ability to be organized. You can't take anything for granted. So if the button guy told you the buttons are coming on Thursday, you better write it down, call Thursday morning to make sure my buttons are here. Or call Wednesday night and make sure that they ship to my buttons. Like you have to have that insane ability of organization. You have to have drive because there's many nights that you're gonna wake up in a cold sweat and say to yourself, what the hell am I doing here? You have to be able to be focused and know what the big picture is. The ability to step back and look at a situation from a different angle. So if you're getting rejected from your favorite store, if the merchandise isn't on time, there is a hurricane in the Gulf, you have to be able to step back and understand that it's not the end of the world and there's a solution to everything, which brings me to having a thick skin and being a solution maker and not a problem dweller. And that's really important because, you know, in, in Spanish we have a saying that you drown in a glass of water when there's a big ocean out there. You don't want those mountains, those little molehills to become mountains. You wanna be able to stay focused on what you're doing. And the other thing is the important 
of the gift of gab. Like if you're a talker, if you're a networker, if you're a meter and a greeter, a mover and a shaker, these are the people that are successful because every single person, for a split second that you meet them, you're pitching them, you're selling yourself, you're selling your product. This is what's important. And you know that we all have somebody that we know that has a store, that has a, uh, an investment company that has some. In New York City especially, we're so fortunate to live like two degrees of separation from something that we want and need. So there is a lot more to talk about. And I just want to kind of give you an overview. We haven't spoken about operations. We haven't talked about design development and where inspiration comes from and what's the balance between fantasy and um, trend and um, sell, things that are sellable. We haven't talked about the production s supply chain and, and warehousing and distribution centers and the lo logistics that go um, with that. All We haven't talked about selling at a trade show, which is very different from sending emails and samples and, and how do you stand out from the other people in the trade shows. Branding and again, giving that want when there isn't even a need. Um, knowing your retail math so that when you talk to uh, nationals and, and chain stores and department stores. You understand what an open to buy is, a profit, a maintained margin, and then we get into all the little scary things like chargebacks and markdown money. You need to know the math. Um, licensing and agreements and again growing and scaling partnership agreements, um, making sure that we understand the concept of cut to order and managing that kind of risk. That's what the investors want to know. And tracking the consumer's behavior. And that's what we were talking about, like getting into that customer's head and being almost able to predict what they want. So I'd like to leave you with this thought. Empty pockets never stopped anyone from making their dreams come true. Only empty heads and empty hearts. This is my information, and I hope that you enjoyed today's uh, session. And I'm going to leave the floor open. Thank you. Um, to, you can applaud. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, I like to uh, open it up to, yeah, some questions. In the, Soli, in the back there. Thank you. Hi. I came in. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I came in a little bit after you spoke about trademarking and um, something about international and protecting yourself. Uh -huh. uh, would you advise um, trademarking in other countries? Because I didn't, I missed that point. So yeah, absolutely. That my whole um, thought on on trademarking is you either do it completely or you don't do it at all because you want to stay under the radar. So um, a, a good trademark attorney will offer you packages like that are available. Like there's a, a package for the United States. There's a package for South America, Central America, uh, one for Europe. The only one I wouldn't invest in money is in the Asian countries because specifically China doesn't protect intellectual property. So you could have all the trademarks you want in the world and there's no way to fight them in court. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. A question in the front? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Betsy John, I read this recently. Betsy Johnson uh, is closing her stores, <clears throat> excuse me, because she's in bankruptcy, etc. Uh, she's been around a long time. Do you have any comment about, you know, for a layman to understand, since she's been around, everybody knows her. What might have created that problem, and in your opinion? Well, you know, there's a lot of factors. And usually when we see like a really well-established brand that files for bankruptcy, it's usually bad management or it's done to um, kind of appease or get a rid of some of the investors and some of the, and you know, I have a, a really strong feeling about Wall Street and being publicly traded fashion company and being in this industry just don't mix. It's, it's n never a good, uh, combination. We look at Liz Claiborne, like why is Liz Claiborne completely shutting down that brand? You know, it was the first brand in the uh, U.S., actually in the world, to hit a billion dollars in sales. She was a pioneer and all of a sudden it's like dusty and frumpy and nobody cares for it anymore. I think that management, uh, licensing agreements uh, uh, has a lot to do with why companies fail it has nothing to do with the consumer's perception of them, how much they love them, how loyal they are to them. But Betsy Johnson is a great example because she has a cult following. Like people love her or hate her, but mostly love her. 
And it's management. That's what it comes down to. You're welcome. Um, I think I asked you this earlier today. Um, how do you balance out, um, say, uh, you got, you're going into production and you're um, meeting the minimum that you and your producer had agreed on, and um, but you were only able to uh, write up pre-orders about a quarter away through what happens, like what would you suggest for someone um, when they have that leftover inventory? Okay, so the question is, what if you don't meet the minimums and you still want, but you have some orders in there? So you hit the magic number. If I'm already a quarter of the way sold, I've already paid for the balance of the production. And, and here's the other thing too. It's really, um, it's a song and dance. It's a pony show. It's smoke and mirrors. So what we do, it's like, and the idea is to make yourself look bigger and more important than you really are, right? And I always feel like if you say it enough times, you actually believe it, and if you believe it, other people believe it, right? So the idea or the conversation is, listen, I'm gonna put in a test order with your factory. Uh, the thousand piece minimum is not gonna work for me. I'm gonna give you 300. I already have my main factory, I'm very happy with them, but you know, business is growing so quickly that I need to have a plan B, and if you're willing to work with me, I'm willing to work with you. That's the conversation. It's all smoke and mirrors. And remember, to get to a thousand, they still have to make the first hundred. So it's about breaking that up too. And maybe using them uh, when it's a slower uh, production cycle instead of when everybody is hustling. And I'm going to tell you something too. Factories are not your friends. They will sell you out for a nickel. So what does that mean? Let's say that your production is on the table and they're cutting it and they're not so happy. They're never going to be happy, right? And then I come along and I'm like, hey, I need my production done tomorrow. I'm paying you a nickel more. Your production comes off the table and my production goes on there. So it's so important to be able to have um, really be organized and following up and, and talking to them. And it's also important to have a local agent or a production manager if you're doing stuff domestically that follows up constantly on all of these things. Question in the back. Hi, um, I just wanted to thank you, first of all, for taking the time to do this Q&A. Um, the second question I have is, um, I, I came in about a half an hour late, so you may have covered it, but who are the people in the retail stores that you need to speak with? Like, is it the store manager? Is it a buyer? I, don't, I'm, I would assume that buyers are not like hanging around there you know, the stores where regular people are shopping, but who well, are those people? Well, you'll be surprised. People? So the question is, who do we contact? Who's the guy that actually makes the purchasing decision? And uh, in most boutiques, the owner operator is also the buyer. And that's who you want to be able to contact. And you know how you really find out who this owner is? Facebook, because sometimes they don't even tell you who the buyer is or, or who the owner is. But when she starts posting about her trips and what, we get the name and we get who that person is. So it's really important to develop the skills of being a cyber stalker because you will get the information that you need. Um, the other thing uh, about that too that's kind of important is, um, and this is like a, an old trick, but it really works and it never fails me. Have your friends come into the store and ask for your brand. So the first person that walks in and says, hey, do you have Go Go Whirl? And you're like, no, I never heard of it. Then, then a week later, somebody else comes in. Hey, do you carry Go Go brand? And they're like, oh, that's the second time somebody asked for it. And then the third time that somebody says, do you carry Go Go brand? You're like, you know what? Let me look them up. Let's what their website. Who are they? Everybody's asking for them. So that's kind of like a sneaky way that you could get your Facebook friends to work for you. Works every time. Um, Another question? I'm going to get somebody else to ask a question. Yes? Um, so how do you look up manufacturers? How do you research them? What's the best way to like? Oh, boy. That is the million dollar question. You know, and, and again, and, and I'm sorry, I don't want to sound like I'm brushing you off, but I, I'll tell you a couple of ways. Um, you have to do your homework, and you have to be on the ground. Like, there are services that referral services that will tell you like the Manufacturers Association in uh, New York or the Korean Manufacturers Association in Los Angeles because just because a lot of factories are owned by Koreans but there, there are those kind of resources but it's been my experience 
that the really good factories don't have a website, don't have a Facebook page. They're busy doing what they're doing, and it's really about networking. So you might ask, like, you go to a fabric show or a sourcing show, which there's a couple of them. There's Tex World, which is held twice a year in New York City. And then there's Sourcing at Magic, which is held twice a year in Las Vegas. So there's actually sourcing shows that you could go to, and they do everything from home textiles to clothing um, to footwear. And uh, so that's another hint. But I like, like, when you're talking to, like, the fabric guys, like, if you go to Mood, and you're like, hey, who are you shipping all of your fabrics to? And they might say, oh, Mr. Lee on 37th Street. You're like, okay, that's Mr. Lee. We're going to pay him a visit. That's really the way to, like, kind of network and source. Um, I kind of oversimplified it, but basically that's the uh, idea. Another question? I have a question. Yes. Um, so you talked about, um, or the focus seems to be on pursuing um, retail buyers and Wait, getting who's your talking. Oh, there hi. you are. Okay, yeah. hi. <laughs> <laughs> and getting your collection or your designs into you know department stores and big shop places and things like that. Um, do you also recommend perhaps starting out at a more local level, like flea markets and bazaars? And no. because, and I only say that because it's how do you hobby. know that there's even a demand or desire for the clothes that you produce? Because if people don't like them, I mean. Well, then you didn't do your homework. Yeah, that, that's, that's what it true. comes down to. So here's my opinion on, on that and also on consignment, because that, I'm sure that that's somebody else's uh, question too. I think that consignment is completely unfair to designers. You have to be able to like produce all of these goods, and then maybe they'll pay you for it. That doesn't work for me. And even as a retailer, like I, I teach retailing. We open stores. I own stores. Um, even as a retailer, I find that if you're asking for consignment, either you don't know what you're doing, you don't have any money to buy new goods, or you're in a distressed situation. Like really good retailers, when they believe in a designer and when they believe in a product, they buy it because they want to encourage the business. We don't want to live in a, a gray world. We want to live in a fashionable, fabulous, colorful world. And, and we do that by supporting legitimately the um, emerging designers. As far as doing craft shows and flea markets and things of that nature, the only time I recommend that, which is kind of odd, but once you find yourself in an in-stock position, I happen to like doing them. I like doing like the Lucky Sales and I don't, what's the other one, Stuckies used to do them. Like I like doing those kinds of events because we're meeting the end use consumer, we're making her a fan or him a fan, and that's how you're able to translate sales online. So if you have your own goods that you want to sell to the end use consumer, that's a great way of getting them to understand the experience of your brand and your fit. So think of it as the Costco method. You know when you're in Costco and they give you like the little fried shrimp and the little cheese sandwich and the little ice cream cake and you're like, oh my God, I love it. And you would have never thought you would have liked it until you had the experience. So think of it that way. Another, I think I have questions. Yeah, I have like five more minutes. Yes. There's a, a couple of things. First, money isn't always a solution to everything. So don't even think of, of that as a, as a problem. Um, the question really is, how do you communicate to the factory what you want made? And unless you're designing something like avant-garde spectacular with a lot of like seams and bills and whistles, you will find that most factories have an in-house production specialist. Or production manager and they will help you and they will sit there with you and help you kind of bring your creation to life so that's a very inexpensive way of doing it uh, Fessler who happens to do knit out of Pennsylvania I, I like them a lot they have a whole in-house team that does this kind of product development um, and they're also a vertical factory which means they actually make the fabrics cut and sew and knit and help you develop it so that's one other way the other way is um, and, and this is gonna sound kind of weird but I've gotten like, the best deals are always made at night at like three in the morning, right? And what I have found is when you go to like student fashion shows like at FIT, at Parsons or whatever, and you meet them casually afterwards, they're all looking for a job. 
And that's probably a really good way of you finding the next hot thing. I mean, listen, Alexander McQueen's uh, uh, project, his uh, thesis, was sold to all to one woman. Like she loved it so much. So you can find inspiration in design and talent by doing some of these things and, and just going out and networking with people. But I have to mention this. I really don't like partners because this is why I feel like people become partners. Either you don't know what you're doing or you don't have enough money. And both of those reasons are not good. And I've never heard a good story about a partnership except for Valentino, but that was different. <laughs> So, um, what was the, the name of that? Oh, Fessler. 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 Yeah, they're great. Don't ask me to spell it, but they're great. Well, and here's the thing. So you're asking me as a retailer, how, how do we pick the emerging designer? Here's the hardest, hardest lesson for a buyer to understand. You have to buy the things that sell and not the things that you like. And you'll be surprised at how much ugly stuff you buy and sell all day long. And it's not a reflection of you as a person. I think that the reflection of you as a person should be and what your friends should be impressed by is all the money you're making and, and how you're buying the things that you like. Not necessarily in the store, but you know, for personal reasons. You had a question too. Oh, somebody in? No, no, no. Um, I. Oh, yes, in the back. Sorry. Um, do, do I need to use this? Yeah. Go ahead. Um. Uh, hope I didn't forget my question. Um, I know you talk a lot more about like um, you know, building your business and you know, focusing more on like the the retailing and getting into that, and um. And I know you did talk about, you know, possibly viewing your hobby as a business when it may or may not. Um, I just wanted to know if there's any sort of like, um, I don't know, words of wisdom you can give for people that are more interested in like doing their own thing online as far as like selling. Did you come in late? <laughs> um, about 10 minutes and I was in the other room. So. Oh, you were? Okay. Well, here's my whole thing. It's so impossible to drive traffic to an emerging designer's website and hope to sell it because the consumer doesn't have any experience with your brand. Once you do some of these shows or trunk shows or events that people like know you and, um, and will buy from you, like become loyal fans, that's a different story. But here's the other thing, the startup cost of having all that inventory and all the sizes and all the colors and everything is ridiculously large. So if you have that kind of money, I would almost encourage you to not open online, but to open a brick and mortar store. Because that's how people get to feel you, they get the environment, they get the connection. And most importantly, you have like your flagship that then you can roll out and open more stores, or you can actually franchise them. So that, that's my advice. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down that route. Yes? So this is the second time I've heard you speak. And uh, each time it's been better and better. Oh, thank you. You're amazing. Thank you. I appreciate that. So my question, though, is you talk a lot about networking. <clears throat> and I teach business communication at a college. And one of the things I stress is networking. But we tell our students to go to networking events. Are there big, important networking events within fashion that are happening that you recommend? That's a great question. Here's my honest opinion. Everything we do is a networking event. Right. Like standing online here at the public library bathroom, that's a networking opportunity. Absolutely is. And as far as like uh, more traditional um, events is um, Meetup, the website, and it's meetup, all one word, dot com. They have quite a few really great um, fashion networking opportunities. There is a Fashion 2.0, which I belong to. I happen to like them a lot. They're having a, an interesting event at Bergdorf Goodman in a couple of weeks. Um, I like, uh, what is it, Open, um, op open Source Fashion, OS Fashion. He runs a lot of really nice events. I also like the Nolcha people who do um, emerging designer fashion shows, but they have a lot of parties and cocktails and um, you know pop-up sh uh, shops that 
uh, offer a lot of these networking opportunities. The, but the other thing is, and I want to caution you this, you don't want to go where other people are looking for jobs and other people, like you want to make yourself be in a situation where, like for example, last, this Monday, there was a conference on technology, social media, and fashion. And I mean, the ticket wasn't cheap to go, but the people that were speaking there were key industry people. And the people in the audience were not broken looking for a job, they were industry people. And that's who you want to network with, the people that can actually do something um, for you. Hope that answered the uh, question. Okay, uh, we'll take one more. I know I'm getting the sign. One more in the back. Yeah, yep. Yeah. No, I asked one already, but here's an opportunity. Um, first question quickly, what's the best way out of all of those contacts there to get in touch with you personally? Um, email me. My uh, first name is Mercedes at Global Purchasing Group. And then to speak to the online thing, um, I'm more of a PR person for my brother's T-shirt line. He's a phenomenal artist. I believe in him. My family believes in him. But that's not enough, right? Then so, family will put you out of business. <clears throat> absolutely. To your point. Um, so what we're trying to do now is we're trying to get on a site called Karma Loop. And essentially what you have to do... Okay, yeah. Feelings, thoughts on that? Whatever what? it takes. Go to Boston, drive a car, bring a dozen T-shirts to do it. That, those are, are key people um, that will promote your uh, brand. And also, you know what, um, Dr. J's, if you're like in that. Yeah, it's um, like kind of urban skateboardish sort of thing. Do it. Do what it takes. Okay. By all, all right. means. Thank you. All right. So I just want to say thank you again. I'm going to stick around for a few minutes if I can be of service. I really appreciate it. Thank you for all your questions.